This is another episode of Let's Talk Game. I'm your host, Tiffany Lewis. For all who follow us on YouTube, thank you so much. But be sure to subscribe to our audio platforms on either iTunes or SoundCloud. We have a special extended version of this episode with running back Kenyon Barner, where he talks about navigating the disappointments of being let go just a week before the season starts. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is not just about football. It's about life helping you get past that dark place. Thank you for tuning in. Let's talk game. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Game. We have a very special guest. I've been trying to track him down. Seems like for years. It seems like for years. But we're going to get into that and a lot more. Um, Mr. Kenyon Barner is here at our studio. Uh, Today's episode is being sponsored by SESM Sports, uh, your leader in faith and athleisure apparel owned by me. A lot of people don't know that uh, this is how the foundation of the the podcast even started. Mm -hmm. And so on behalf of SESM Sports, I want to present to you, you've had what you're running the mill with the shirt, but Mm -hmm. now that you're a Panther, new team color. Well, thank you. uh, Let's turn it towards the camera. For those who are going to be watching God First Family Football. And so the message behind this um, tee was all about perseverance, right? And so in the NFL as a whole, there's a lot of hope and perseverance that's taking place, a lot of Mm -hmm. shifting. And so I'm just going to get right into it. Like, let's talk game. What is it? um, What is it about Cap? Like, is he really ruffling that much feathers? Kaepernick, um, the boycott is 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 just. My thing with that is, I think the feathers that are being ruffled are from closed-minded individuals, closed-minded people who aren't open to having a, con- a real conversation about mm-hmm. things that are really going on mm-hmm. in the world that we live in, on uh, you know, in the country that we live in, and so you're closed-minded. You don't want any change to happen. It's going to ruffle your feathers. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to acknowledge the fact that there's social injustices that take place among minority groups. You don't want to acknowledge the separation between minority groups and Caucasians. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to ruffle some feathers if you aren't open minded and willing to accept what's going on in the country that we live in and are willing to have a conversation about it. So then, I mean, as a as a player with inside perspective, I mean, beyond the huddles, I'm talking about like the brotherhood that you share Mm -hmm. with your teammates. Mm -hmm. Uh, the brotherhood that you share um, with people who are not your teammates, but are also within the NFL, Jonathan Stewart. And shout out to him. That's shout how we met. Yeah, oh, that's how we met. Um, you all have that Oregon bond. I'm going to take a little detour because I can. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know that Jonathan mm-hmm. and I were, you know, besides neighbors, mm-hmm. um, we were friends for a, a while. And, you know, he held Charlotte down, the Carolina mm-hmm. Panthers down Absolutely. for a strong decade. Absolutely. And so um, when he said, get in touch with you, it was like, I just trusted that you were a solid guy. And that's why I can ask you the I tough questions that. from the jump because, you know, mm-hmm. Stu is solid. Absolutely. And so going back to that brotherhood, like that you share with him mm-hmm. and other guys like him that I probably would fail to mention because I don't know mm-hmm. how deep it extends. I mean, what is that conversation like with them? Like, what are you all talking about? It's a about? great dialogue. I, the couple was was that last week, um, there was a group of us in a running back room, um, talking about the national anthem Mm -hmm. the kneeling um you know the president we're talking about all this and it wasn't just black guys in there yeah you know we had greg olson in there we had jj in there myself we had cap cj anderson um who else was in there um mike was in there Mm -hmm. you know just a great diverse group of guys having a great dialogue about things that are going on and them able to listen to our perspective of thing, me able, us being able to listen to their perspective on things. Those are the com- type of conversations that develop that brotherhood when you guys can be open mm-hmm. to each, where each other have come from, open to what you guys have been through, come together, have a great conversation, and meet at a common point. Um, so that's where that brotherhood is developed, and you know, th- those locker rooms are special. So I think you made a great point because um, some of the players you mentioned, they're not black. Mm-hmm. And so so brotherhood extends beyond race. Absolutely. And so and, and hopefully, I mean, with the commercial, with Nike's commercial uh, and hopefully with all of the things that Kaepernick and everyone who supports him, not just by kneeling, but just really by uh, impressing upon 
you know, the whole equality matter, matter right? Mm-hmm. And all of the other things that he stood for and represented, um, that it has nothing to do with, well, it's not all about race. Not all about it's race. It's not all about race. Because with that being said, um, listening to Greg Olson and listening to his background, things I didn't know. Yeah. Um, you know, minorities aren't the only people that go through things. Mm-hmm. Minorities aren't the only people that experience injustices. Um there's plenty of other people that go through the same thing. And Greg Olson is a, is an example of that, you know, mm-hmm. having that conversation with him about his upbringing, about his dad and stuff like that. Um, that was eye opening. And obviously, you know, those type of things take place, but that's the type of things, the type of things that, and conversations that bring people together. Mm-hmm. Because you're like, okay, you've been in the same situation as I have. Right. Um, I wouldn't have known that had we not had the type of conversation that we had. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's not just a black, a Mexican, you know, Latino. It's not just that. It's a everybody. Thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as a player, how do you respond to the the resistance as a player? As a player, man, you, you deal with it. You yeah. know it's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, but you stick to what you believe in. You stand for something or fall for anything. So as a father, how do you respond? As a father, you have to, you have to stand strong, especially yeah. being a father of some black kids, minority kids, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you have to stand, you have to stand firm. You have to stand strong because I am setting the example for them. Mm-hmm. I am what they look to as a man. Mm-hmm. I am what they're going to look to. I'm going to, I'm, I am what they're going to refer back to yeah. as they get older. Okay. What did my dad do? Mm-hmm. How did my dad handle situations? Did he run from it? Did he stand? I'm that example. Yeah. So as a man, as a black man, I have no choice but to stand firm. Mm hmm. That was my last one. How, as a black man, you stand firm. That's Absolutely. how you respond. Absolutely. So, like, in terms of, um, I, I guess it's a, a perfect segue because just recently you met with and you spent a day mm-hmm. with um, some police officers in Corona. Yeah, shout out to Corona Police Department. Uh, uh, appreciate y'all. <laughs> I mean, how was that even set up? How did that come about? So, one of my closest childhood friends, uh, Rosie Rail, he works with Corona PD. Okay. Um, and so me and him went to junior high school, high school together mm-hmm. uh, down in Calvary, out at Calvary Chapel, Moreno Valley. Mm-hmm. And um, he had been, me and him had been, been having great conversation, you know, going before everything really became a big deal. Uh, me, and him, me and him had been having conversations about, you know, the relationships b- between police and community police mm-hmm. and the minorities. Um, he's a white guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but he grew up around me. Yeah. He grew up around, you know, my family. He grew up around you know, minorities. So he has a different perspective on things because he's experienced it by hanging out mm-hmm. with us. Mm-hmm. Um, Both the good and the bad. The and the yeah. Bad. Um, and so he would probably five, maybe five or six months, maybe a little longer. He's like, come on a ride along. Come on a ride along. Wow. Come on a ride along. I'm like, in time, bro, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come. <laughs> and then so this last time I was home, he was like, okay, I set it up. I'm like, what do you mean you set it up? <laughs> he's like, I set, I, I, I set the ride up along. I'm like, all right, well, I'll be there. And so um, that that was a great experience. Um, Wasn't that Martin Lawrence who played in Ride Along? No, that was uh, Kevin Hart. Okay, Kevin, Kevin Hart. Hart and, uh, Kevin <laughs> did you, Hart so did you have any Kevin Hart moments? Like, I know you said, you actually said you had to make some split life or death decisions. Right. Like, it was real. Well, it, so that wasn't a simulation. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it wasn't to the extent that police actually go through okay but even in that simulation it it it, it gets your blood pressure up. Mm-hmm. you know it gets you antsy because in that simulation it's life or death it's your life or mine right um and so from that perspective yeah but uh kevin hartman we did a traffic stop <laughs> <laughs> and as we're making a stop i'm telling uh rosie i'm saying rosie i need a gun mm-hmm. i need a badge <laughs> I need a I need a book. I need it all. Did you get it? No. <laughs> <laughs> he gave he gave me a polo. He okay. Gave me a nice shirt and uh, he let me hold his nightstick. For okay. A bit. Um, but man, we just had fun with that. We had fun with that. That was a great experience. But going back to that simulate those simulations, uh, the first simulation I was responding to, I believe it was a domestic dispute. Mm-hmm. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, obviously. Mm-hmm. No police training whatsoever. So I watched Rosie handle it, that he stepped in and took over for me so I could see how, how it's supposed to be mm-hmm. done. And so the next simulation I had, it was a traffic stop where a guy had a gun and a car gun in his hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm, I see the gun. I'm telling him I'm going to drop the gun. You know, place your hands where I can see him. Guy still has the gun. He's fidgeting with the gun. Um, tell him to drop the gun, drop the gun. He's not responding like yeah. I want him to respond. Yeah. Um, my gun is obviously drawn. Um, 
tell him to drop the gun one more time, place his hands where I could see him, and he flinches with the gun, and I shot. Did you hit him? I hit him twice. Wow. I, no, I'm a good shot now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, I just wanted to know. I just yeah, want- <laughs> um, he, he wouldn't have made it. Yeah. Um, but it's in that instance where you're, where you're questioning, did I make the right decision? Yeah. Could I have talked him down? Yeah. You know? But I didn't have that kind of time. Right. Because my life is in jeopardy. Getting back to my family mm-hmm. is now in question. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when he jerked with that gun, I don't know if he's shooting. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just don't know. Mm-hmm. And so it was in that particular simulation where it's kind of like, man, like, this is real. Yeah. You know? Um, it shouldn't be you or me, but it is mm-hmm. to a certain extent. And so that kind of really placed things in, my, in, in a different perspective for me. And so I, I bring that up because I think it was a perfect tie in to, you know, what the kneeling is taking place mm-hmm. for. Because on on the opposite side of many of those guns, unfortunately, mm-hmm. is a black man, right. you know, or a black child right. as it's become. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's a serious matter. Mm-hmm. And unlike your friend, who's a police officer, who whose scales is a little more balanced, mm. a lot of people don't come with that perspective. Right. And so I wanted you to be able to shed that light in, in terms of your experience, mm. um, because I think it was important, you know, as far as like the whole NFL kneeling and, you know, protesting, mm. it, it, it goes beyond football. Yeah, it, it, it's in our communities. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely is embedded in terms of how the minds of police officers mm-hmm. think, right? right? And so, yeah, I wanted you to share a little bit about and, that. And taking that a little further, um, but during that ride along after it was over, mm-hmm. um, I think we finished around maybe three. I was there at from seven in the morning till about three in the afternoon, mm-hmm. three or four in the afternoon. But even after that, I sat around, I sat around probably for two and a half hours, just having conversations with different police officers, with the sergeant, with the lieutenant, um, us all coming together, like having, you know, just having an open dialogue yeah. about what I thought about situations, what they thought about situations and how everything is handled. <clears throat> and uh, what Corona PD does, they do a lot of community work. Mm-hmm. And I think that is probably the one of the most important things that a police department can do, because I don't think your first interaction with the community should be when you're pulling somebody over. I agree. Within that community. I agree. You don't know that person. That person don't know you. All that person is seen as the thing that are, things that are taking place on TV, so they're already on edge. You've experienced as an officer the things that are going on on TV. Mm-hmm. Now you're on edge. It's an uneasy situation now that that situation of a simple traffic stop is intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and so I believe the first interaction should be within the community. I think police officers should be able to get out into the community, meet these kids, meet these families, be amongst this community to get to know the community that they're policing so I they agree. know what they're dealing with, who they're dealing with, and the community can do the same. Know the police officers, get to know these officers by name, recognize their faces. Oh, I seen you at the community event last week. How mm-hmm. you doing? Blah, blah, whatever it is. But I don't think the first time a stop or your first interaction with the cop or with the community should be, you know, a, a tense traffic yeah. stop. And it but, speaks to the level of compassion that you have because you said – hey, from that experience until you step on the other side. And I think Mm -hmm. vice versa, not just stepping on the side of an officer, but stepping on the side of, you know, a minority, right? right? Um, That speaks to the compassion. So with you leading in with compassion and you also being, you know, in that ride along with someone who you grew up with, Mm -hmm. like what, and and after that conversation with the lieutenant and the officers, what questions did you have that were answered for you? Well, for me, it's being an athlete, being in the NFL, when one athlete does something wrong, we all get grouped together. Mm-hmm. When one cop does something wrong, they all get grouped together. So for me, and it was the same questions going both ways, I wanted to know, and my question was straight to the point, how do you guys feel about the things that have taken place? What side of the fence do you stand on? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Philando Castillo case, what side of the fence do you stand on? Do you think that officer was right? Do you think he was wrong? And from everybody that I talked to, he was wrong. Yeah. Um, and they said that. And that's the thing we want people to understand as officers. We don't stand behind these cops that are out here making these terrible decisions, mm-hmm. having these horrible actions. We don't stand behind that. And that's what the community doesn't understand. I said and the, the community doesn't understand that because just like us, we don't come out and say anything as different players mm-hmm. when a player, whether it's. 
domestic violence, uh, drug trial, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. As players, we don't come out uh, come out and speak against that, but we know where we stand on it. Mm-hmm. And just like you got, it's the community doesn't hear you guys come out and say that. So when things happen, we look at you guys. Oh well, they you know they're all standing. For yeah, you, they're know? silent. They don't. Yeah, <clears throat> but that wasn't the case. Yeah, and so to be able to have those type of conversations, that was a that was a question. Just I needed to I needed an answer to. What do you What do you guys think? Where do you guys stand? So when things like this happen. What what takes place within you know within within the station? What do you guys do? We um come together. We have a meeting. We talk about it. We deal with it. Um, <clears throat> but you know that that was one of the main questions. That I was needed. a great question, uh, and you really you opened my mind up, yeah. and I hope you open a lot of people's mind up because hey, just like in the NFL, they have huddles too. Yeah, exactly. And it's a brotherhood too. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's that that was deep. Yeah. That was deep. And so, I mean, you obviously have strong values, right? Mm-hmm. Who were some of the people who modeled what you now portray as mm-hmm. a father, as a professional, mm-hmm. as a man? Like, who who did that modeling for you growing Firstly, up? Firstly, it was my immediate family. Mm-hmm. It was my mother, uh, my father, uh, my sister, um, my, my brothers, Martel and Keander, those are the, peop- the the ones that I really grew up with. My bro- other brothers are a lot older than me, so they mm-hmm. were out of the house. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but uh, those five individuals really set the tone for me. Yeah. And then once I got older and started to branch off and started to leave the house, like, there was other people that I came across. Um, I have a family down in Oregon, the Riley family, John Riley, who is an amazing man, mm-hmm. an amazing man. I love that man to death. I love that family to death. He was somebody that... I really took it liking to him. He took me under his wing when I was young in college and showed me the ropes um, from a different perspective. Um, There's so many, so many people, so many different directions I could go. Uh, coach Stovall, mm-hmm. who's my friend Jeff Stovall's father, he used to coach at Canyon Springs High School down in Reno Valley. That was another man who would talk to me yeah. and you know give me life lessons. Uh, Skip, uh, the running back coach for the Panthers, mm-hmm. another guy who would give life lessons and coach Campbell at the University of Oregon my running back coach there um let that man to death he would give me life lessons yeah. you know we would have real conversations and stuff like that so I've come across a great group of men and women mm-hmm. that have really molded and shaped me into who I've become my godmother my nana uh the Liz my, my auntie uh, auntie still auntie B just the whole squad yeah you know, it, you know the, the, the saying of it takes a community it takes a village yeah and that that's what i've experienced and that's what, those are the people that's what has helped like i said shape mold and develop me into who i've become so so what what how much of them are going to be at the first game on sunday uh my dad, my, my, so my mom doesn't fly um, at all my mom doesn't fly no she she's flown she's flown for me twice uh, so is she in Washington? No, she's in all my family's back in California. Okay. Um, so my dad flies, my brother flies, my sisters, uh, you know, my friends, but my mom, she's not getting on the plane <laughs> no time. So come on, <laughs> mom, got, dude. Got, so when I got drafted here in 2013, <laughs> mm-hmm. she got on the plane mm-hmm. for me. Um, but she had to stay for two weeks because she wasn't getting back on the plane wow. no time soon. And then when we went, when I went to the Super Bowl last year. She got on a plane for me and flew there, but I don't think she'll be getting on a plane anytime, <laughs> anytime so. soon. <laughs> How uh, a lot of people don't know you started with the Panthers. Yeah, a lot of people don't know. So yeah. 2013, 2013, yeah, and now 2018. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How does it feel to be back? Felt good to be back. Uh, <laughs> you know, just to be back. I've ne- so I've never stopped coming back to Charlotte. Mm-hmm. Um, I've developed some great relationships with people here. You know, Stu. Um, Kenny Delon, these are all guys. Kenny Delon, Kenny uh, used to play. He played for the Panthers. Mm-hmm. Um, but Delon, uh, AJ, AJ Marshall, um, and y'all. Miley. Well, most of those are most of y'all are dads now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like a lot of us are. AJ, yeah. Stu, yeah. you. I mean, so yeah. within that time, <laughs> a lot of shame. <laughs> We've been busy <laughs> within that time, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So you know and. These are guys and girls, Alexis, you know, girls who have remained in my inner circle. Yeah. And so I've never stopped coming back here. I've never stopped loving this city Mm -hmm. because Charlotte is amazing. Yeah. You know, so 
if I was to ever leave California, it would be for Charlotte. That says right. a lot. I'm yeah. from Charlotte. Yeah. I think it's amazing. I do think I there's areas it. of growth that are necessary. That's everywhere. It is. That's everywhere. Yeah. But I, I love, I love this city. Mm-hmm. I absolutely. This is one of the few cities that I can say, like, I genuinely love being in. Yeah. Um, despite whatever weather may come this way. Mm-hmm. I love this city. So what is the hardest part? I mean, talk about a lot has changed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you're still doing your thing on the field, but... What's the hardest part for you as a father navigating, uh, you know, being on the road, Mm -hmm. but having, you know, young children? How does that look for you? Like, what is your game plan? The hardest part is being away. Yeah. Um, That's by far the hardest thing uh, because with both my kids, I miss so much of their younger years Mm -hmm. Um, with my oldest son. I've missed practically everything. Yeah. You know, being away um, during season, out of season training because I don't train out. Off season, I don't train in California. Mm-hmm. I leave California and I go to Albuquerque, New mm-hmm. Mexico. Um, the desert. So, yeah, <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing out there. But I, I miss so much. Like, even with my youngest son, he's saying, Mama, he's saying, Dad, Dad, mm-hmm. he's, standing, he's standing up on his own. You know, I miss when he started crawling. Yeah. Because um, he used to arm, when he first started, he would arm and crawl, just use his arms to pull himself. Mm-hmm. And now he's crawling, he's standing up on his own. You know, his interactions are different. Um, and so you, you you miss all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you see pictures, you see videos, but that's not the same. Yeah. So that that's the hardest thing for me is, like, I got a five-year-old and I still haven't learned how to, like, be away and, like, really deal with it. Uh, FaceTime all the time, mm-hmm. you know, so I see him. But, I mean, it's a, it's a dip, it, major difference from a phone conversation yeah. to, you know, a physical presence being there. Um, so that's that's been the hardest part for me is just still learning how to adjust to being away mm-hmm. to where my family is not with me, you know. My, and I, that's with everything, being away from my mother, my father, my brothers and my sister. I'm, like family is the most important thing to me. Um, that's tough. And I think you said, again, a big perspective because although we're cheering mm-hmm. and there's like glitz and glamour for mm-hmm. – um, the sport that you chose as a profession, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there is a downside. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, that, what I do is just like any other job. The only difference between what I do, you do, or the next man or woman does is my job is on TV. Yeah. That's the only difference. Yeah. Um, but we still go through the same things everybody else goes through. So what helps you persevere? What helps you keep pushing? Prayer. Yeah. God, um, like, I've been on my own since I was 18, so I've kind of adjusted to being on my own, but it never gets easy being away. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still times I'm 29 years old, and there's still moments where I want my mom. Yeah. You know, I, I wish my mom was here. I'd lay on my mama's lap and mm-hmm. go to sleep. There's still times where I want to be around my brothers and sisters, be around my children. Um, that'll never change. Yeah. That'll never change. That's huge. What's your, what's your mantra, or what's, like, your, your go-to, like, scripture? I would say Joshua 1, 5 through 6. That's impressive. <laughs> um, I would say that and what the, I hope I'm saying that right. I hope I could be wrong. I shouldn't be wrong. I write it on my wrist before every game. Um, but it's, the basis of it is be bold, be courageous. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> You know, God is with you. God is overcome. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that I carry with me. Um, and another one is um, greater is he that is in me because he's already overcome in the world. God has already overcome the world. So nothing that I face here on earth can really cause any harm to me because the God that I believe in is already overcome it. And so I turn to him, leave it in his hands. I'll push, I push through and I'll make it through. That's awesome. Yeah. And so for you, I say be bold, continue to be bold on the field. I hope you have a an amazing season. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate everything that you stand for. I think you really shed a lot of light on some questions that people are going to continue to have mm-hmm. as they're burning those uh, <laughs> Nike checks. Yeah. And This all blows over whenever it does. Guess what? Your kids are going to want some Nike <laughs> shoes, some Nike gear. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to go you got to get it. it. 
So cut it out. Yeah, cut, cut it, it out. out. Literally. Yeah, cut it out. Yeah, <laughs> cut it out. This has been amazing. Thank you for uh, your time. Thank you for coming on the show. And definitely, oh, I want to, sh- even though I presented you with um, a tea from our, our, our company, I know you started your brand. So yes. tell the people about it. You're so rocking me and, it. Me and my friends, they're like my brothers, mm-hmm. uh, Joseph and Jonathan back home. We went to junior high school, high mm-hmm. school together. Mm-hmm. Um, we started this uh, brand called Hate It. Um, and, you know, when people think of hate it, you think of all the negative meanings that come along with the, neg- the negative feelings, the negative emotions <clears throat> that come with the word hate it. Um, so what we wanted to do, we wanted to take that word, flip it, give it a positive image, a positive meaning. Um, but not only that, but make it something that everybody could relate to, mm-hmm. not just black people, not just white people, not just, you know, Mexicans, like whatever it is. We want it to be everyone that could relate to it not just my generation my parents generation my grandmother likes it uh, for that matter um you know my grandmother's 94 years old wow um but so what we did we took hated and made it into an acronym which is having ambition towards everything desired and i think that's something that anyone who wants something out of life they can relate to that you know you have to have ambition you have to have desire in order to accomplish anything any goal that you have in this life without it you won't and so that's what we wanted to do we just wanted to create something with a positive vibe a positive feel to it and uh just have you know have it engulf everybody not just a younger generation but it be something that like i said my grandmother can like my grandmother can wear that's awesome what's the website hatedapparel.com all right you know, go check us out we have to we have an instagram uh let me. I'm gonna look at the Instagram before I say something wrong. And um, and and all pro, like a percent of each shirt sold, uh, it's gonna go towards. I'm just joking. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do. Man. Yeah. So our Instagram is hated underscore apparel, and yeah, just go check us out. Um, okay. You know. Now that was part one of my interview with KB. In part two, hear how he navigated the news of being let go just a week before start of the season. May his words cause you to persevere.